Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Oh my Lord, expand my breasts, ease my task, untie the knots in my tongue so that they may understand what we say. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and welcome. I'm Heather Mehdi and this is the voice of Free Pakistan for our listeners and viewers around the world and inside Pakistan. Thank you for watching and listening. We are here because of you. Uh, today we have a very special guest and I really genuinely mean a very special guest. I have the great pleasure uh, in welcoming none other than Ryan Grimm, the, the co-founder of Dropsite and formerly with The Intercept. Welcome to the program, Ryan, and uh, greetings. Nah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me here. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Uh, I'll try just a brief introduction to you, even though most Pakistanis know about you and what you've done at The Intercept and Murtaza, but I want to just set the context that uh, your biggest claim to fame for us in Pakistan and outside Pakistan, Pakistanis, are the wonderful breaking news stories that you and Murtaza have done uh, for Pakistan and lately with Vakas uh, on Pakistani matters. I mean, you people were the first to post the entire contents of the cipher, so-called cipher between Ambassador Majid and the Foreign Office of Pakistan, which showed the threats to Pakistan by Donald Liu and clearly uh, indicating that these instructions, uh, and then leave no doubt in everybody, the mm -hmm. instructions came from the White, Biden White House. Um, you've published many stories on Pakistan, on the fascism that's going on, the election steal, uh, PM Imran's view about uh, the army chief Asim Munir and the politics of Pakistan, and the latest, of course, on Archie Sharif. You've been an author, a renowned journalist. You were the Washington, D.C. bureau chief for the Huffington Post. You were formerly the D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept. Uh, this month, earlier this month, you and The Intercept's co-founder, Jeremy, left The Intercept to co-found Dropside News. We'll talk about that in a little while shortly. Uh, you have appeared frequently in many, many uh, very popular shows, the majority report with Sam Sader and was a were contributor to the Young Turks. Your articles and, and, and commentaries have appeared in Rolling Stone, Washington Post, Politico. You're the author of this, of this wonderful book, This Is Your Country on Drugs. We've got people and the squad. Wow. Wonderful. Before uh, we go on to the meat of the matter, in which is really about uh, seeking your insights about the Trump assassination attempt, you know, the who, the what, the why, the conspiracy theories, uh, what is the impact on the presidential elections, Trump's prospects, and if elected, uh, the impact on the global scene, specifically on Pakistan, which we are very keen to know your views. Uh, will Trump give up uh, on the the kind of narrative the, the American establishment has about Pakistan. I'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, we'll also talk about Asha Sharif's uh, assassination expose that you've done with Vakas. But first, Ryan, why this interest in Pakistan? Uh, and if I may, what happened at the intercept and now a drop site? And how can Pakistanis help? So, yeah. So to take the, the second part uh, first, you know, I, I, I wish the, the intercept well. I hope hope everything works out there. There's been some public reporting that uh, Jeremy and I and and others, uh, Murtaza among them, um, had, you know, had a different idea for how to make sure that the Intercept could remain the kind of fierce and independent outlet uh, that it was. Other people had other ideas. Uh, we decided that we would, you know, set up something independent. The Intercept is actually supporting us in that endeavor. So it's not as if we're uh, competitive or trying to undermine each other. The Intercept is you know, gave us a founding grant to get us uh, off the ground. It's dropsitenews.com. Uh, uh, we actually uh, launched a, a targeted fundraising campaign to try to expand our coverage of South Asia and Pakistan um, in particular. Um, I, I sent you that link, but I, I don't remember exactly what it is, but um, it, we're hoping to you know, do a lot more work with w Wakas Ahmed, who you just uh, mentioned a so, moment ago. So I have and also, this link here, yeah. Brian. And also right. Murtaza, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's support drop site news reporting the plight of democracy, human rights in Pakistan. And uh, this was a, this is a wonderful, wonderful graphic of Imran and Asim Muni. So tell us a little more about it. Uh, is drop site going to be focusing in addition to you know the other stuff uh, also on Pakistan on a regular basis? That's our pl that's our plan. Um, it you know it, it requires resources, uh, and we're hoping that we'll be able to bring. My my former colleague Murtaza Hussein over to over to Dropsite as as well. 
but yes, that is that is the plan uh, that we're going to continue um, covering. Uh, you know what what is a, a a tale with a lot of twists and turns and you know ebbs and flows and you know it uh, and it is long from over. You know this 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 fight is is not over. Uh, as to the question of um, you know what brought me to this this story of Pakistan's kind of democratic awakening and then repression and perhaps reawakening. Uh, you know, I've been covering foreign policy as the DC bureau chief, American foreign policy, the impact of American um, decision-making around the world uh, for a long time. Uh, and I was watching, you know, the, the democratic, uh, you know, reform movement and the rise of Imran Khan with some, with some interest and then seeing the the repression and the kind of counter reforms underway got me interested in covering it a lot more closely specifically when uh the uh, when the military cracked down on on the media there in a, in a way that was reminiscent of you know previous censorship waves in in Pakistan but to me seemed you know ut just utterly you know preposterous to call in broadcasters and publishers from around the country, sit them down for five minutes and tell them, all right, you're not mentioning Imran Khan anymore. And then, and then just overnight, he just disappears from broadcast. That, that to me struck me as uh, wild enough that it was time to really start paying attention uh, to this story. Uh, and through, uh, we, then we were able to reach out and get an actual interview on my podcast with, uh, with Imran Khan uh, himself, which got me kind of more interested in in the story and then i think as our as we continue to publish about pakistan and uh, as our profile inside pakistan grew people there realized that we were an outlet that you could you know provide documents to and that it would be published and that it would have an impact you now there was nowhere there was nowhere to publish those documents inside pakistan and uh you know, out, outside of Pakistan, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of news news organizations that have bureaus inside Pakistan are somewhat compromised. You can't necessarily trust that your documents are going to be, you know, handled with care and won't wind up in the hands of somebody who has some relationships that are going to lead to exposure of sources. And it, we also have a you know a Western audience, so that you know our reporting is read in the State Department, in Congress, in the White House, uh, in in ways that, uh, you know, some other outlets, so if you publish it in a South Korean paper, you know, it's not going to have the same impact here uh, in the United States. And so we, we definitely um, hope to continue and plan to continue that work uh, over at, over at Dropsite. Um, and if, if people can help us out, be either by becoming subscribers to Dropsite or um, by making a gift through that fundraiser, uh, that would help us do that. Uh, certainly, and, and that's a really because that was my next question: is how we can how can we help you? So, uh, just in the in the interest of transparency, I want to uh, state for the record that I have no commercial relationship with Ryan Grimm or Dropsite of any form and sort. This is not a plug for them uh, to fundraise. This is a genuine request to all Pakistanis who want a fit, a, a vibrant free authentic objective reporting on what's happening in pakistan in the western hemisphere especially in north america to influence policy makers this is a a a site this is a news outlet this is a media outlet that you genuinely need to support i've been trying for the last two years to help set up some kind of a voice in english for the north american audience and i know it's very difficult and there you offered this uh, to us on a plate just to let you know, I've just subscribed about <laughs> half an hour before the program. Amazing. So when you when you click on support now, there is a one time that people can go uh, for 100, 250, 500, 1,000 other, which is there. Or they can go into a monthly and, 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 uh, and uh, do that. So that's excellent. And I will uh, seek people to please, please, and I would... Post this link in in the uh, description of the program. Please go support this. This is for you. This is for Pakistan. This is for your present. This is for your future. Uh, Ryan and 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 team have gone out of their way like no one else has gone out to support 
a genuine free democratic Pakistan. So thank you for that, yeah. Brian and Murtaza and Vakas. Uh, and I appreciate that. And I think one reason, just editorially, that we just that we continued you know, covering it, I think was was the reaction we saw both inside Pakistan and and with within the Pakistani diaspora here that the, it, it clearly is an audience that is hungering for this news um and and that is and, it, and that is eager eager to get involved and and i think believes in a lot of the stated american values more so than the american government does and really wants to hold the american government accountable to those values and that's and that's really what our journalism is always about is saying like okay here are the values that that you you profess and you state publicly we're not telling you those are the values that you need to profess, but those are the ones that you do. And here are your actions. And the gap between your actions and, and your state of values is, wh is where our where our journalism lies. And the, the February 8th elections were also uh, like something I'd never seen um, in my life. Over here in the United States, as I'm sure you've noticed, it's very difficult to get people to go and out and vote. And that is with you know, mailing people ballots, keeping the polls open all day, keeping the internet on all day long. The polling location is uh, is identifiable. It's near your house. You can Google it. You can find it. It's easy to get there. Uh, there are accommodations uh, made for you if you have disabilities. And still, we can barely get less than half the country to go out and vote. So to see a, a people in Pakistan confronted with, you know, with violence, suppression the party kept off the ballot uh candidates uh, arrested and then on election day to see uh the, the internet taken down polling locations uh moved around uh you know endless amounts of shenanigans to try to prevent people to vote and to, the party's to see, symbol taken away which is the, the symbol most important. the symbol taken away and to see the kind of human spirit persevere through that was Amazing. was just inspiring to watch that's so thank you so much for that appreciate that um uh, just a quick one on the drop side would you um, ryan would you be inviting uh, eminent pakistani journalists uh people you know who have have struggled who have a voice uh on on your program so you can hear the, like the local side of the uh, of the truth or the version of their version of the yeah truth? yes and we so we were able to we're in a partnership with the intercept uh jeremy and i both took our both are going to continue producing our podcasts. Uh, Deacon's mine is deconstructed. Jeremy's is, is intercepted. And I also host the show uh, on on Wednesday mornings called uh, and, and Friday mornings called Counterpoints, which is part of this the Breaking Points Network. And so th those are all opportunities for us to to bring those those types of guests on. And I've t I've actually talked to a lot of uh, um, of our uh, Native American. Uh, I would say not Indian, but native, native yes. born here in the United States um, uh, audience. And they would say, you know, I was skeptical of this, of this Pakistan coverage at first, but I'm, fa I'm, I'm, I'm bought in now. Like they, they, they really are invested in kind of in seeing how this plays out. And they want to see the United States government, you know, do the right thing by the Pakistani people, which to the, to most people's mind is either stand up for your values or just back out like leave pakistan alone and let pakistan make its own decisions like you it's it's not as if pakistan the united states needs to tell pakistan what to do um but they shouldn't go in and, and just under, undermine the the democratic will there and so we're seeing a lot of kind of our our other audience that is kind of now getting interested in this coverage as well so 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 it's really interesting uh when you mentioned the the here are the values and here are your action here's the gap and we tell mm -hmm. them where the gap is and then we saw this uh, very strong bipartisan resolution passed in in congress uh, that was surprising mm -hmm. and uh, and which me which now brings me to the american establishment of the american uh, administration's current administration's view of pakistan vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis India, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Kashmir, vis-a-vis -vis our nuclear assets, vis-a-vis -vis recognition of Israel, vis-a-vis -vis supporting the army, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, not supporting democratic values in Pakistan, uh, supporting a 
a, an extremely fascist army chief uh, keeping Imran Khan behind bars, you know, dancing around the bush, not saying it. I, I've seen you ask some very difficult questions from, from the State Department spokespersons. So this is what's happening today. Let's go to the Trump at, uh, assassination attempt. First, a brief on that, and then its impact on his presidential prospects, election, if he's elected, what impact will it have generally in, on the globe and on Pakistan? Well, we're, we'll find out more Thursday, tomorrow evening, uh, when Donald Trump speaks at the RNC. Interestingly, there are a lot of Republicans in Washington and now out in Milwaukee at the, at the convention who are actually quite worried that they're going to get a new Donald Trump, uh, that, that, something, some, that something might have changed. And, you know, they, they have, I don't think they have followed the kind of arc of Imran Khan, but there are some interesting you know, parallels between the, these, the two figures, you know, both, both celebrities, um, uh, you know, who then became populist and popular figures, both who then survived assassination attempts. We'll see, we'll see what Trump's arc is, is from here. We know what Imran Khan's was. Uh, so what's, what's so fascinating though, about American politics now, and I don't know if this is the case in Pakistan, a week from now, we will, not have forgotten the assassination, but it will have been so thoroughly metabolized by our by our fast moving culture that it will not have the kind of impact that something like that would have had in the past. The what what will have a bigger impact, I think, is whether or not Democrats successfully pressure Joe Biden out of the top spot. Uh, you may have may or may not have seen that just news alert that just came out now. That he just that Joe Biden tested positive for COVID, uh, which perhaps is the is the final push that he needed. He he said you know he would basically only step down if uh, the Lord Almighty called him. Well, may, maybe this was a call from, from the Lord Almighty telling him, "Look, it's time it's time to go." Uh, so so uh, so that's one piece, and I was just reading uh, a a. A news item which said two out of three Democrats want Biden to step down. Is that true? That that is that is true, and it, it's growing every day. Every time he gives a new new interview, has a new press conference, gives a new speech, uh, anybody who sees it basically says, "Oh man, this this guy cannot be president." You know, he is he is rapidly degenerating, and and was already struggling uh, several years ago. I can't imagine. Um, how how COVID is going to hit him now it, it, it's a much weaker variant that's going around and he's you know many times boosted um but he's still in a you know he's still in a vulnerable situation so so Rand, thanks and back to trump so do you think this attempt has actually increased his presidential prospects i mean someone said the bullet that was supposed to kill trump actually killed biden which was kind of a <laughs> tongue-in-cheek pithy comment so that's one. And if he does get elected, uh, what are, how do you think it will impact uh, the globe in general, the, but specifically Pakistan? And that's really important for us. Right. And right. so uh, it, it probably did you know, help uh, Trump you know, so, so much. Like the, the, the assumption and the conventional wisdom here is that it, it helped him significantly. I don't think it helped him as much as people think. Okay. And, the big, and the big question is still what are what what's going to happen on the Democratic side? Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's as guaranteed a president as, as it's not suspect. a shoe in anymore. People are saying it's a shoe in. You don't, I don't think, think so. It, you wouldn't want to bet your life savings on it. Okay. Uh, it, it could still go the other direction. It, in fact, people should consider everything that's gone right for him and then consider the fact that he's still only a two point, you know, up by two points. Like that shows a serious amount of weakness. Now, at the same time, Joe Biden outspent Trump in June on the airwaves about 100 to 200 to one in the swing states. And with Trump spending basically no money and spending his time in court getting convicted of felonies. Uh, and yet Biden was not able to gain any ground whatsoever in that time. So so you could you, you can you can still cut it you know both ways if you need to make make an argument. I do think that he's still definitely the favorite so a trump administration 
uh, is is a crapshoot in some ways because so much depends on who is dominant within Trump world politics uh, oh. and who is who is up at that moment and who is who's who's on the outs, uh, who has his ear at particular moments. Uh, he's extremely susceptible to the last person that spoke to him. You know, he's one of those. Everybody knows those types of people. He's one of those. Like everybody wants a jockey to be the last one to speak to him before he has to make the make the big decision. Uh, people were new to this dynamic in 2016 when he was first elected. Now this network of people around him have had eight years to sharpen their knives and practice their 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 palace infighting. And so, uh, you know, ba basically, if the if the Pakistani diaspora is with the people who are ascendant at the moment, things will be going well for them because I think Trump and uh, Imran Khan do have a, a they're simpatico, like they're similar people. I think they like each other. Uh, they they see eye to, eye to eye, like they they kind of get each other. Um, but that only takes you so far. Like you know, Trump is about Trump first and and foremost. Uh, and so, and so if if his if Imran Khan's enemies, if the military establishment, if others, uh, you know, have have their people who are ascendant within the Trump orbit at the time, it can go the other direction. And it's wow. it's really impossible to predict, and it's it's chaotic, um, and it and it will and all of those things you, you'll have both elements at at different times. There's no you can't just say all right, well this is the ideology, this is the this is the way that they think about it, and so this is these are the steps that they will take because it's just not an ordered um, operation in, in in by any sense of the word. Wow, that's a that's just a, a very constant fight. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, it's just a, it's just a constant fight. Yeah, just be, you'll that's be on a, your toes for four years. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a huge insight. I never, no one ever kind of gave that, and and I, I certainly I didn't get that. That this is, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like it's like an unguided missile. You know, yes. whoever has that, <laughs> whoever's riding the missile, <laughs> who's ever riding the missile at the point <laughs> will take the missile where it wants to go. That that is, uh, that's a, that's a. That's especially especially when if you think about where pakistan sits in the kind of orbit of power in washington it's on the outer rung and so it's the kind of thing that that trump is willing to to deal on it's not the kind of thing that he's going to to be guided by his own impulses necessarily like he might believe one thing but if somebody else is telling him something different and let uh, and it involves china or it involves india or all any of the things that you mentioned um, he, you could, you could imagine him being influenced in that way. At the same time, I think the the diaspora and Imran Khan himself have a lot of assets that that the Trump administ that that Trump and those around him will be impressed will be impressed by. Wow, you know, I had this very, in my opinion, a very well thought out question for you, but that goes out of the window because I said, you know, I had this 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 nice little narrative which said will trump and i'm just reading all will trump give up on chinese influence in pakistan peace with india dump kashmir you know the Amer uh, the nuclear arsenal defanging pakistan relationship with afghanistan and iran the muslim bloc that was emerging you know with iran going talking to mahathir and uh, this uh, the crown prince of saudi arabia and, and Erdogan, and this regional economic bloc with mm -hmm. china russia etc uh, the recognition of Israel, but let's see if this is all. If this is all immaterial, it's it's whoever has access to this guy. Uh, you know, that's the way decisions are going to go. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and there are some champions of the Pakistani diaspora who you know could have some influence there. I think M Mike Pompeo um, has been. It was his sec. Who was his Secretary of State has been and his CIA director. You know, has been working on behalf of. I think as an agent, I think as a public agent on behalf of um, some Pakistani groups in DC. Really? Yeah, um, I think uh, Pak Pak, I believe. Um, okay. Is, is Pak consulting Pak directly. And First Global. Yeah, is consulting directly with uh, Pompeo, uh, who is, you know, you know he ha he is a powerful faction within that world. Um, you know, if he's if he's persuaded to use his power, and if he's if he happens to be in at that moment, then that's 
then that is a that is a good person who for the Pakistani people to have who who has Trump's ear. JD example. Vance. Yeah. I think JD Vance um uh has a uh is, is very susceptible to the argument from the Imran Khan supporters. Um particularly on the one hand that uh well first of all it's it's it, it, republicans love to blame things on democrats so they could say look what the biden administration did look you know pin you know pin everything that don lu did on the biden administration uh jd vance also believes in you know sovereignty and and democracy and and in non-intervention you know it's complicated and he's very pro-israel and um so he he uh it's not a kind of consistent universal approach but in general he's he's a he's on the kind of non-interventionist side of the republican party and i think would um would would you know you could see him approaching the pakistan question from that perspective mm, interesting and and uh, was this expected uh, is this a, a deliberate well thought through choice by trump to bring in this non-interventionist this uh, uh non-interfering kind of person because that has been the hallmark of uh, trump's previous uh, administrations mm -hmm. yeah i actually uh went, went on our program when we were when we were making our predictions who would he who will he pick in a few months mm -hmm. time Mm -hmm. um i picked you I, I guessed jd vance jd vance you he's did the one. did you yeah, he, he, he's the one he's the one who who's I, I put my chips on him uh and at the time people said that that that's not that's impossible that's kind of a pipe dream for jd vance supporters the reason they won't do the reason they won't pick jd vance the reason he won't is that he doesn't bring anything extra to the ticket he's he's like a co carbon copy of trump you know without the celebrity his all of trump's supporters also like jd vance all of jd vance's people like donald trump and so it doesn't it, it's one plus one equals one um mm. so why do that electorally uh you know pick somebody you know who's going to bring in some of the some black or, or, some, or who's going to or pick a woman or you know like do some some type of cynical electioneering in that sense uh what 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 that pick says is that trump feels confident enough that he's going to win that he doesn't that he doesn't need any bump and he wants a loyalist he wants somebody there's um who is with him he, he doesn't want a kind of broad coalition where you've got the vice president who disagrees with him on half the policy and it makes a big tent he wants both of he wants he wants somebody who's going to be firmly loyal to Trump. yeah mm -hmm. and he feels confident enough that he can do it mm. So um, this this uh, I, I have a I have a very dangerous thought that just uh, ran through my mind, uh, which is if Trump were to lose this election and genuinely so, uh, like you said, he's just two percentage points above, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, despite the assassination, were he to lose this election, I'm not sure how the Trump supporters are going to respond, and are we? potentially seeing a massive upsurge in violence across the country i have had that same thought that given how confident they are that they're going to win this fair and square that if they don't uh they're going to lose their minds and you will there's little you could do that persuade them that they lost fairly uh, i don't know about violence i i, I think you know the vast overwhelming majority of people just simply are are not interested they have too much to lose their families don't want them getting involved in violence like all this talk about civil war in the united states is to me absurd like just it just misunderstands like the nature of this country right the now. dynamics like, of the country oh okay. we are like there are there are, a lot of people are struggling to make it to make ends meet there's no question about it but we're also we also have the best economy in the world, um, rich, richest country on earth. Um, people have a lot of things and a lot to lose. And so going out in the trenches and and getting into civil wars is just not 
I just not really on the docket. It's an it's um, a kind of an outlier thought, is it? It is, and also um, after January sixth, the the right wing has been completely unable to organize any mass demonstrations of more than like a dozen people because they're so paranoid that it's a trap by the by the FBI and that they're going to wind up spending years in prison for the protest. And so they have they have just been um, completely denuded of that ability. Now, there could be so much rage that they push past that. But the the level of paranoia within the right today is equal to that of like the left in the, the revolutionary left in the 1970s here in the United States. And, and that, that, that left completely collapsed uh, in, in fighting was unable to kind of. Sounds very similar to what's happening in Pakistan, Ryan, the paranoia amongst mm -hmm. the people of Pakistan, the PTI rank and file is so huge massive that they and, fear and, if they come out two things will happen they'll go to jail and imran khan will be then charged formally officially right. with treason inciting rebellion etc so very right. interesting similarity so so uh two two last question for you Randall. so the trump assassination the, the who and the why and the conspiracy theories what's your view um, uh, so my my view is so the there's a huge question of how did this kid get on the roof and why were they not manning that building? How did it, how was he able to get those shots off? And that has given rise to enormous number of conspiracy theories. My simplest guess at this point, and I think maybe we'll, maybe we'll, we'll actually find out. It was that where he was shot was about an hour and a half from here, maybe two hours from here from Washington, DC pit, out just outside of Pittsburgh, I can tell you it was insanely hot and humid that day. And at the rally before Trump spoke, he was late speaking. You were hearing people saying medic, medic constantly. I, I was just watching online. I wasn't there. Uh, the rally goers were just were fainting. Uh, There's no shade anywhere. It was a brutal day. Local police were tasked with, with making sure that these buildings were guarded. If you ask me, those local cops looked around at the 110 degree heat coming off the pavement and said, this is going to be fine. And they just and they and we know that they were inside the building. So so why were they inside the building? Were they paid by some agents of the deep state to allow the kid to get out in the building and and shoot him? I think a more plausible explanation is that they were hot they, and it was they were lazy and they thought to themselves, what's the worst that could happen? Come on. Nobody's going to, nobody's climbing this building today and doing anything. And they um, went inside and they made the wrong decision. That's, that's my guess. I mean, you, 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 you're talking about the donut cop. Well, so the, there, there, there are several of them. Yeah. Um, and then one of the cops, like the, then the, the crowd to its credit was like, look, there's a guy up on the roof. And one of the local cops then climbs the roof and confronts him. Kid points a gun at him. He retreats back down the ladder. And then and then the kid immediately fires at Trump. So in some ways, the, the crowd, by egging the police on to go up to the building, kind of made the shooter rush his shot. And if, oh. and if the crowd hadn't done that and he'd have had a more relaxed moment to put Trump in his sights, then he very well may have um, hit, you know, hit his target. So your summary statement, uh, this, this I understand, but your summary statement of Pakistan and the Trump administration is this, that Trump is susceptible to whoever speaks to him last. His view about Imran supporting the military regime, Asim Munir, etc., will depend who has filled him with the information about Pakistan is mm -hmm. that I mean we're literally hanging by a third here, Ryan. Yeah, that's right. And and if uh, and also the key thing is who does he think is loyal to him? Who has praised him? Who has said nice things about him? Like mm -hmm. currently, uh, Netanyahu is in Trump's doghouse. Yes, and be, because he congratulated Biden on his victory. Mm -hmm. That was. 
it's not the genocide. It's it's not anything else. His crime was congratulating the new president on his on his victory, and and Netanyahu has spent months groveling to try to get back into his good graces and and sending every ambassador that he has you know to Trump to make the case. So even in a situation where um, the financing, because he's got Adelson. Adelson's widow spending enormous amounts of money on his campaign, the financing, the lobbying, the power, the ideological alignment. You can have all of that. Um, if he's personally piqued about it, then that's going to be, that's going to play a dominant role too. So uh, if, if he believes that, you know, I, I think that Trump does recognize that he's, he's pretty popular in Pakistan. Uh, and by when he, and he, and he loves that, like mm. he likes people who like him. It's, yes. it's, it's like that simple. So, um, God. Get, like Kim Jong Un so said, nice we things. We need to really go, get, yeah. we need to really get close to him and suck up to him to make sure he does the right thing for Pakistan. Yes. Basically, basically, <laughs> right? I, I I know we're running out of time, but I have to because this was a really massively insightful report that you and Vakas did for uh, for Archit Sharif. Uh, the question is, why did you choose to do this after the Kenyan uh, High Court ruled? What, 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 what was the motivation, and 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 what do you hope to get out of this? Because this is massively insightful. Well, we had uh, been working on a story, you know, for a, you know, we'd been working on a story for a long time. Um, had you know, had been trying to get the fact finding team report uh, before it was before it was leaked, um, and then. You know, through uh, through a Kenyan source, you know, we were able to get our hands on on a copy of this ruling, and so you know, once we had that in place, we decided, okay, let's let's take the reporting that we've done and 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 move quickly to publish this ruling so that so that people can read it. Um, that this needs to be disseminated publicly, especially uh, because it rather shockingly, you know, shows that the entire story that the, the Kenyan police and the Kenyan government was telling publicly about their, about how the entire assassination went down just changed on a dime. And they told a different story, a completely different story. They, the entire thing about uh, somebody, you know, shooting um, at the police from inside the vehicle and, and shooting an officer in the hand uh, and just speeding off. Like, all of that was gone. Like none of that showed up in this judgment or in the or in the hearing. And I, I think that I think that the Kenyan paramilitary police who carried out this killing just simply did not expect the scrutiny. I think that they were used to um, not they themselves, but in general, the Kenyan police Kenyan police who engage in these types of assassinations were used to carrying them out and the world moves on and the country moves on and nobody really, you know, looks into it any further and whatever they say, like they've made this mistaken identity claim repeatedly turns out if you, if you go back and look. Um, and in a lot of cases, people, you know, just, there, there, is, there aren't the reporters and there aren't the fact finding teams and there aren't the uh, judges who are, you know, I think because of uh, the acclaimed career of, of Arshad Sharif, um, there, the world wasn't ready to just move on. The world wanted answers on this. And once they started poking at the story, it just completely fell apart. Because it, was, it wasn't built to withstand scrutiny. It was built to just be a statement that you give and everybody goes away. Well, that was a brilliant story. And I just, at the end, I want to uh, remind our viewers again, please support Dropside. Please, please, please. Especially... Pakistanis in Europe and in the United States and Canada. Please support this website. Please support this news, a news media outlet. Please go become a member, become a monthly member. I've become a monthly member. You're urging me now to become a founder member. I wish I can. I hope I have enough money to become a founder member. Uh, but please support uh, 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 Dropside. Do a one time, you know, however much you can do a monthly, you know, myself, Vakas, Moeed, all of these guys, we've been uh, trying for the last one year to to uh, to get this thing going. Somehow or the other, get a Pakistani 
Huffington Post going or something. And mm -hmm. here, Ryan has handed this over to you on a on a on a platter. Um, not only is Ryan and and J Jeremy and the others who they're going to have voice heard in the corridor of the fight a very powerful voice. So please support, please support this. I will urge you, I will keep reminding you every time I have Jeremy or Ryan or Murtaza or Vakas on our to please do that. This is a great favor you're doing to yourself. It's not doing a favor to Ryan, you're not doing a favor to the drop side, you're doing it to yourself. You're doing it for Pakistan. You're doing it for your for your freedom, for your democracy. I mean, these guys are saying any overseas Pakistani who supports Imran Khan and PTI, we will cancel their passports. I mean, that's right. the level of transnational repression. So please support Ryan. Please support right. Jobson. Ryan, thank you very much. Any last words before we wind up? No, it's just very, very kind to you. Um, and it's, it's a real pleasure to to come on the show. Your 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 courageous voice in these dark times. Um, and you know, thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, Ryan Grimm. Uh, we will call you a jihadi, you know, and a jihadi not in the in the right. terms that the West kind of shudders, right. but in the in 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 the, in the term of a person who is fighting for what is right, who is fighting in, for the right values, who is fighting. The, well, for yeah, in, in in the U.S., as I'm sure you've seen it uh, for many years, the, the the highest compliment you could pay to somebody was that they were a crusading journalist. They're a crusading <laughs> journalist. They might I not say that anymore. Visual. They they might not use that phrase anymore for political. It might be in <laughs> politic, but uh, but I I appreciate your your kind yeah, words. But but you're right, you know. And when you use the word crusading, it's, oh, the crusades, Christians against Muslims, you know that kind of. But you're right. I mean, it's it, it's exact, it, the exact same uh, the exact same sentiment. Yeah. So Ryan Graham, thank you very much. I hope to have you again. I know you're a busy man. But, uh, you know, please happy give to us come the on. pleasure and yep. the honor of having you again on our program. Thank you again. It'll be, it'll and wishing pleasure. you a good night and hoping to speak to you again. Thank you, Grant. Right. All right. See you later. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nazim, I will talk about the word. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistani, all those uh, Pakistanis who are listening and watching and have heard this program, Please, uh, this is a very insightful program. Uh, Ryan uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a jihadi, jihadist for Pakistan, for freedom. Um, please circulate this program as widely as you can. Please support Dropsite. Uh, and may the work that Ryan and others are doing for Pakistan, for Pakistan's freedom, for Imran Khan, for fundamental rights, for human rights, for a free democratic Pakistan come to fruition. And uh, wishing you all the very best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and all your loved ones. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all those people in Pakistan, inside and outside, who are working for a free democratic Pakistan. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ease the distress and pain of all those who are in jail. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, jo qayt mein, musibito mein, unki mushkilain asaan kare, jo Pakistan ki haqiqi azadi ki jang lar rahe, unki, uh, un, unko hifzo maan mein rakhe, aur jo is jang mein, بیچارے شہید ہو گئے ہیں اور اسمان تعالیٰ ان کے درجات بلند کرے پاکستان زندہ بات پاکستان پائندہ بات الہی حامد السلام علیکم خدا حافظ